Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. If you have one of these small modified sine wave power inverters, you may have noticed an interesting behavior that they exhibit when the battery voltage decreases on these inverters. For this particular unit, and also for a lot of comparable units, when the voltage drops to about between 10 and 10.5 volts, the inverter shuts down to protect the battery and to ensure that the power output peak voltage from the line voltage side doesn't drop below a set value. This makes a lot of sense when you're powering this from batteries because you don't want to deep discharge your batteries all the way down to zero because it can damage them, whether they're lithium or lead acid. But what's weird about these inverters is they have an extremely wide window of hysteresis during which the inverter will remain off until the battery voltage rises up high enough to turn it back on. In the case of this inverter, it will not turn back on until the voltage at the input terminals rises to at least 11.5 volts after an under voltage lockout. This is exceptionally high, and it presents a big problem if you're trying to run it off a battery system where the voltage could regularly drop below that 10.5 to 10.3 volt minimum. As a result, I found that there was a need for me to build a system or modify this inverter so as to allow it to operate in a fixed voltage window that I can strictly control. So what I went ahead and did was did just that. I built this modification circuit here, which I'll show you later on, to basically force the inverter to operate over a particular voltage window. In the case of my system, which is going to be a solar powered installation with a lithium titanate battery pack, I wanted the inverter to shut down at exactly 10 volts, and then I wanted it to remain off only until the voltage rose to about 10.5 volts, at which point I would allow the inverter to reactivate. I do need a little bit of window to prevent the inverter from being basically short cycling on and off very quickly as the battery voltage recovers and then lowers again, but I wanted it to be a lot tighter of a regulation loop than what I was getting from the inverter's stock configuration. So let me show you why I selected this inverter and show you some of its characteristics. Now this power inverter is sort of a, an off-brand inverter. This is a Samlex Power 450 watt inverter, modified sine wave. And I really didn't think much of using it. It was sort of just a uh, gift that was in a box of other auto parts uh, until I realized that the Harbor Freight Inverter that I was using, which has otherwise been fantastic, had a fairly high quiescent current of around 700 milliamps when operating uh, with no load. Now for just running it for short periods of time on a battery or on your automobile engine or something, it doesn't really matter. But the point of this project, which is a solar power system, is that this inverter is going to sit running all day and all night, 24-7, off the lithium titanate battery that's been installed in the system. And that means that I really want the inverter to draw as little power as possible when there's not a lot of load being placed on it. Now, like I said, my other inverters draw in the, in the range of uh, 700 milliamps to up to 2 amps for my big 1500 watt inverter. But let's have a look what happens when I plug this in to the power supply. Now we got to wait for the fan to go out because the fan in this definitely needs to be replaced. But if we look at the quiescent current, 259 milliamps is really quite low for a power inverter. This is generating 120 volts modified sine at the output uh, and it's, it's not shut off or in any kind of standby mode, that's just the amount of power it uses. Now if I flip the switch all the way off, you'll see that it actually pretty much goes to darn near zero. There's no draw at all. And when I do turn it back on, once the fan stops making noise, the, uh, it pretty well stabilizes to that same level. Now let's see what that uh, does across voltage. Let's go up to a max voltage, say 14 and a half volts, still around 293. And let's take that down to like, uh, let's say 10.8 volts-ish, still around 240. So less than 300 milliamps across the entire input range. That's pretty good. And for a large battery, the battery I'm building is a 40 amp hour battery. This really shouldn't use more than just a few percent uh, of the battery life over the course of an entire day which is going to be very, very nice for operating this uh, continuously to make sure that I have 120 volt supply pretty much all the time. So now I'll show you how this circuit actually works. So right now I'm supplying the inverter with 12 volts and you can see the green light is on indicating the inverter is active. So what I'm going to do is start dis, uh, dis decreasing the voltage gradually and when we get to 10.5 volts this is our upper bound threshold, but since we're still above the minimum threshold, it's not going to turn off. But when I continue to go down, when I hit 10.0 volts, you're going to see that the light has now gone off just under 10.0 volts. 
Now, let's say the battery uh, starts recovering or there's a recharge and it starts raising in voltage. It doesn't turn on yet. This gives us some headroom to prevent oscillation. And then if we continue to go up, when we hit 10.5, turns right back on and starts up. So that's exactly the behavior that I want from this inverter. And that's not the behavior it had originally, but now that I've installed these additional circuit components, it behaves as such. So how did I get this inverter to operate down to a specific custom minimum voltage with a specific custom minimum recovery voltage? Well, this is the circuit that I've implemented. Everything on this side of the circuit I've basically kept the same as it was originally. The input voltage comes into the inverter, goes to the low side switching transistors, and additionally, the low side switching circuitry is configured exactly the same way as it was originally with the transistors. What I've changed is the power being routed to the switch on the front of the inverter, which then feeds through to the low side switching circuitry, I basically have interrupted. I've disconnected this switching circuitry from this power switch. Instead, what I've then done is I've routed the power from the switch into an adjustable boost converter, which I've set to an output voltage of 15.75 volts. We'll get to why I chose that specific voltage in a minute. What I do then is I feed this voltage to a uh, pass transistor. This is a 2N2907 PNP pass transistor. I then run it through a uh, moderate voltage drop of a few diodes in series to make around 1.8 volts. This is simply to make sure that the higher voltage does not exceed the rated input voltage of the low side switching circuitry, which can accept up to about 14.5 volts before shutting down. And then I control this pass transistor using a 555 timer or an NE555. Now, although this circuit is typically used as a timer IC, there are a couple of interesting uh, circuits that I use all the time with this IC that are not even related at all to timing. Instead, this 555 implements hysteresis. Now, what I mean by hysteresis is it basically has an upper and a lower threshold window, and it effectively behaves like a Schmidt trigger, where it will not turn on the output until the uh, voltage falls below that minimum voltage threshold, and it won't turn the output back, uh, back off until it goes above the upper threshold. So the way I've configured this is I've taken the lower threshold, or the upper threshold rather, and connected it directly to the input power supply from the battery. Now, the reason, now we can talk about the reason why I selected 15.75 volts as my supply voltage. You see, inside a 555 timer, there are actually three resistors in series that are typically 5K ohms, which is actually where the chip originally got its name, arranged such that they create a voltage divider. This creates the comparator reference for the threshold and trigger pins, respectively. The upper bound is one or two thirds of the input voltage, and the lower bound is one third of the input voltage, since these three resistors are of the same value. That's why I selected 15.75 volts. This divides into thirds to 5.25 volts on the low end, which is fairly arbitrary, but more importantly, it divides to 10.5 volts on the high end. This just so happens to be the voltage that I want to have the inverter uh, recover at. So when the inverter has already shut down, as, it is, as the battery is being recharged by the solar panel, when it hits 10.5 volts, the inverter is allowed to turn back on uh, by effectively activating or basically pulling low the PNP pass transistor. On the other hand, as the battery is discharging, I've configured this low side uh, trigger pin to be operated at 5.25 volts, which I can then control very carefully using a 10K ohm voltage divider, uh, basically a potentiometer, connected also to the power supply with a filter capacitor to ensure that there's no ripple that could cause erroneous triggering. Now this has the effect of allowing me to basically tune whatever I want my floor voltage to be for the uh, turnoff mode of the inverter, but for the sake of my battery design, which I basically want to keep with a little bit of reserve power to maintain the BMS and other equipment, I've designed it to basically shut down at 10 volts. So I tune my potentiometer so that when 10 volts is supplied from the battery, the voltage at this potentiometer wiper will be exactly 5.25 volts. This means that as the battery voltage drops below 10, it basically forces the pass transistor input high, which deactivates the pass transistor and turns off the switching circuitry. This is actually identical to flipping the switch off physically, which makes it a really safe way to interface with the inverter in such a way that you don't risk creating any shoot through conditions or other er erroneous behavior on the uh, low side switching control circuitry. So that's how I've actually configured it. 
And you can see the physical implementation here. If you look closely at this device here, this board, you can see I have my really quite overkill uh, boost converter. You could use a much smaller one. This is just the one that I had on hand that then steps the input voltage, whatever the battery voltage may be, up to that 15.75 volts. That's then fed to the 555, which has its requisite support circuitry, as well as its adjustable uh, potentiometer, and the PNP pass transistor, which then feeds the uh, output 15 volts from the uh, converter through this stack of three diodes to the output that then supplies the high side or low side switching circuitry. So here's a look at the inside of the inverter. The way I've configured it is I've taken the power supply input line to my control module here, and I've wired this to the switch. Now the input of this switch is connected pretty much directly to the fuses and then to the positive input of the inverter, which means it should be a relatively good approximation of the input voltage from the supply to the inverter coming off of the main uh, battery input. Now I chose to put it behind the switch so that if necessary, if I want the inverter's quiescent current to be truly zero during an off state, I can flip the switch and turn off everything, including the boost converter on this module, so as to really minimize the current being drawn by the inverter. When the switch is on, the power supply from the battery is fed into the module, where it's then boosted up to the requisite 15.75 volts, and then supplies the relevant control circuitry. Now the output of the pass transistor is fed via this yellow wire, which actually connects to the other uh, original switch connection that would feed the low side control module. This part here is the low side control module. Now if I zoom in here, you can see that there's some ICs on this chip on this board here. And these are what actually control the gates of the inverter MOSFETs. The inverter MOSFETs then drive this power transformer, creating the 170 to 180 volt DC rail which is then re-inverted at 60 hertz using these output transistors. Now, although I didn't expect this inverter to be particularly high-end or well-constructed from the beginning, there are a few things that sort of caught my attention that are something of red flags that I think I'd like to change in the future. The most notable thing that I noticed about this inverter is that the main switching transistors that drive the 60 hertz modified sine wave output have no heat sinking whatsoever. They're just basically TO220 packages that are mounted to the PCB and are basically just floating in the free air. Now this is made even worse by the fact that the blower fan, which runs when the inverter is under heavy load, is actually situated in the back section, blowing across the heat sinks on the low side switch and pretty much not directing air anywhere near these switching transistors. Now this heat sink is made in a stylized, well I should say not heatsink, this case is made in the style of a heatsink, but in reality there is actually no part of this case anywhere that makes contact with any of the switching devices. That really means that this almost would be better off operating in free air with the fans still blowing across the uh, main switching transistor heatsinks for the low side switching than it would be to be in this aluminum housing that's basically just blocking airflow. Now as it is, I'm going to put it back in the housing just for compactness and to keep the high voltage insulated, but in the future I may consider adding heat sinks to these switching devices if I see a high failure rate. The consequences of the devices here failing really aren't that high, uh, assuming this inverter has overcurrent protection on the low side. If one of them fails short, it'll just basically overload the transformer and throw a, an overcurrent error which should trip the inverter into its off state, which is a pretty safe failure mode. I do have uh, comparable MOSFETs that I can put in to replace these if necessary. So uh, barring that the high side switching controller is not damaged by a failure in these devices, it should be a relatively easy fix if these do overheat in service. Now normally these MOSFETs actually don't dissipate that much heat, but if you're driving heavily capacitive or heavily inductive loads, the large transient currents or overshoot voltages can result in thermal dissipation within these packages more than what you would expect for the relatively low power dissipation caused by the on resistance of the devices in series with the load. Another issue I've encounter encountered with this inverter is this capacitor here, which is actually only rated to 180 volts despite being the main filter capacitor on the high voltage side of the switching transformer. The DC bus supplied by this switching transformer can be as high as 190 volts when the device is being supplied by a full car automotive alternator voltage of 14.5 volts, which not only gives zero safety margin for this capacitor, but actually exceeds its nominal rating. This could definitely be an issue if you're using this in an automotive application, 
or in any application where you're supplying the inverter with over 14 volts. Now my solar panel system that I'm going to be using to power this will not be charging the battery beyond 14 volts since this is a five cell lithium titanate system. So I'm not extremely concerned about this capacitor failing, but it is something to keep in mind as a potential failure mode if the inverter starts behaving erratically. So hopefully you learned something about how to control these modified sine wave inverters using external circuitry. I should note that not all inverters are going to respond the same way, and not all of them are going to be measuring the input voltage from the switch. Some of them may be externally powered from the board. Additionally, inverters that do pulse width modulation to control the duty cycle of the AC output may also have problems with this technique if you're sending a fixed voltage into the control electronics. So just keep that in mind, and if you're going to be working on inverters, also keep in mind they do have high voltage inside which should be pretty obvious since they are 120 volt output, but definitely be careful if you are going to work inside one of these inverters uh, while testing it on the bench. So thanks for watching Dielectric videos, and I will see you next time.